I like to begin these interviews at the beginning. You're the only person who is sitting in the same town in which you was born. So can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? Did you grow up here in Berkeley? No, I didn't grow up here in Berkeley. The reason that I was born here, where my parents were then living in San Francisco, was there was no bridge. There was no bridge in 1932 on either the Golden Gate or the Oakland Bay Bridge. Everyone co commuted back and forth across the bay by ferry boats. Yes. So my parents were invited to uh, supper and drove on the automobile ferry uh, over to Oakland. And then during supper, my mother said, uh-oh, and she absolutely refused to go back on the ferry boat across the bay. So I was born in Alta Bates Hospital here, uh, where subsequently both of our grandchildren were born as well. But I wasn't really uh, a Berkeley resident right. until I came uh, to college in uh, 1950. So you, you grew up in San Francisco? No, all over Northern California. Ah, why? Uh, various reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, my father uh, uh, gave, uh, uh, was his work was to uh, be in the logging industry, equipment uh, things, and so he was very much a traveler, and so uh, we lived in several places. But then my parents were divorced, and my mother moved to where some relatives were, and then we moved again after my grandmother died, and so oh. we moved around, so, but oh. in Northern uh, California. Um, to, to focus on the school that, the high school perhaps, that you went to, um, can you, what I'm searching for is a sense of either the intellectual background in your home or the school that may have begun your intellectual progress. Well, one, uh, one quick fact is that uh, <clears throat> my father's older brother went to college and became a dentist but aside from that, either in my father's family or my mother's family, no one had gone to college. Really? So, and until, uh, until my time. But I want to tell you something about uh, school. Yes. So my uh, first junior high and high was in Chico, California. And uh, I want to particularly mention things about detective stories. Do you know these interviews with... Uh, David Suchet, who has portrayed Hercule Poirot. Uh, Wonder wonderfully well done uh, things. Of course, ITV has the advantage of hundreds and hundreds of hours of TV to make right. very good interviews. But uh, it's really very charming, and I recently bought the whole collection of Poirot stories. They, they were able to uh, film everything that Agatha Christie wrote. And I loved Agatha Christie in my uh, uh, middle school, junior high school time. And so in Chico, one Saturday, I went to the city library and checked out three Agatha Christie books. Right. And as I was checking them out, the librarian looked at me and said, you know, we have other books in this library as well. Right. But that had a big influence on me that kind of uh, uh, storytelling. And, and mystery searching. <laughs> but the thing that had the biggest influence on me at that time in the uh, beginning of high school in Chico was my band teacher. I played the clarinet yes. at the time and he was very, very supportive of young people. In fact, he told me one day, the reason I like teaching is that the students never get any older. Yeah. <laughs> and he was really great in, in getting uh, kids to uh, realize their, uh, their talents. So he saw that I was interested in how it is that instruments produce their sounds. So he gave me, on loan, his copy of uh, this book. It's by uh, Dayton Clarence Miller, the science of musical sounds, and not so long ago I was able to get a very nice uh, used copy of it. 
One thing that Miller did was to make sounds visible. Of course, he didn't have the kind of electronic equipment that we have today, but he was very clever as an experimental physicist to do that. And it was absolutely fascinating to learn where sound comes from. But in order to understand the explanations, you have to know the maths behind it. And so one of the main things, of course, are trigonometric functions as periodic vibrations. And so I had to teach myself a lot of math in order to do that. And then as a subsequent from the references in that book, when uh, the, in the second half of my high school time, we moved to Sacramento in the uh, library of the uh, uh, state legislature there. It was a very, very quiet place. Hardly anyone used it. I discovered Helmholtz's book uh, on uh, musical sounds, and that had an incredible influence on me. In later life, I read about Helmholtz, one of the most tiring biographies because he did so much in his life on yes. so many, so many fields. But uh, in the question of uh, music and uh, acoustics, uh, he explained all kinds of things about tunings and temperaments on, on instruments. And in order to understand <clears throat> a tuning, you have to understand logarithms because the scale on the piano or any musical instrument is a logarithmic scale uh, when you just go the CDE, uh, uh, just, just go through the scale. It's really logarithmic as you go to higher and higher sounds there. So to understand that and to understand why temperament works out, uh, I had to learn a lot more mathematics to do it. And so that maybe is a, is a lesson that uh, curiosity will lead you to places where you have to uh, look at things in ways that you wouldn't have thought you would have until you found that you had to know the reason why something happens. But I need to tell you a story about uh, Chico. That yes. was uh, my, first, uh, uh, my first high school. Because many, many years later, when my wife and I were living in San Francisco, it turned out that our, the husband of our next door neighbor had also had his schooling in Chico maybe about 10 years uh, earlier than uh, when, when I was uh, there. And I asked him, did you ever, did you ever have <clears throat> Mr. Iloff as a math teacher? And he said, let me tell you about Mr. Iloff. Uh, Dan uh, had become a lawyer and lived for many years in San Francisco. <clears throat> and once his uh, firm sent him up to Chico uh, to uh, take part in a trial there. And uh, he was there in the courtroom when one of the first things that happened in the trial was that an expert witness was brought in. It was an expert witness, a retired math teacher, Mr. Iloff. And the first thing that happened was that they asked him, do you recognize anyone in this room? So he looked around and then he saw Danny said, oh, I remember him. I taught him algebra and he didn't do very well. <laughs> so that's the revenge of your math teacher. Did you had him as well? I had him. Oh, yes, yes. He was, a, he, he, was a very, well? he was a very, very good teacher, but uh, he made you work, right? That's all that. <laughs> it was... Was there a salient mentor, I mean, I heard about the music route, but was there a salient mentor that saw in you the talent that began to guide you toward an idea of what your next stage would be? Not really. I mean, both in Chico and in Sacramento, uh, the high schools were very, very good, and I was very lucky to move to Sacramento because it was closer to... Uh, to advanced uh, society. I mean, in Chico, I probably would have gone to Chico State and become a high school teacher. Okay. But in Sacramento, 
and the high school there, uh, it, people had come from all over, and so I had the idea that it's possible to go to university. And of course, in those days, if you got a B plus or so average, you could go to Cal, UCLA. Right. Uh, everyone was uh, was admitted, and the costs were credibly low because the state state supported uh, things. Uh, it's no longer true, I'm afraid, and so we wonder what will happen to our grandchildren who are getting close to college age. Anyway, it was really the combination of the uh, teachers, but then also that I taught myself a lot of math. The math teachers were good in both places, but I taught myself a lot of math, so I got a taste for it. Right. And so when it came time to come to uh, the university, I had already decided that that would be a good major. What there. are the ambitions of this 18-year-old at this point, as you're just beginning to go to university? I think just to get on with life. But what was completely the change my life with Berkeley, I don't know whether you experienced it all yourself, was that coming from Northern California, you know, it was a very homogeneous population. I had no concept of European culture as a Northern Californian. And then all of a sudden here at the university, there were people from all over. And, uh, uh, you know, I met so many different kinds of people. And also, as I'll explain later, the European influence was, was very strong. So uh, that completely changed things to have that university experience. In the university process, one comes to choose a major, one co comes to choose um, certain professors to follow. How was that developing in your, in your intellectual progress? Well, at the beginning, I really didn't know what uh, higher mathematics was going to be like, and so it, uh, it, it turned out that certain of the teachers and professors that I met uh, turned me then to the subject that I was going to, to really concentrate in. So uh, the uh, first thing was that uh, I had to earn some money to go to university, so I was working in the library in the periodicals room. This was a period before the publishers tried to bankrupt the libraries by having so many periodicals. So there was just one room in the Dole Library where all the periodicals came and they were held for about two years and then bundled up and sent to the boundary, to the bindery to uh, put in the um, in the stacks. So while I was uh, filing the journals that had come in, I came across the Journal of Symbolic Logic and I opened it and it was all completely nonsense to me. I couldn't understand, but there was one article I just happened to see. You know, I was doing this when I was supposed to be working, but I was looking at the things back in the stacks where we kept the, the journals. And there was one article that I could understand, and so I checked that out and read it. And then it turned out that the next semester, the author of that article was teaching an elementary math course here. Uh, he was a Polish man who had escaped from uh, Poland just after the war, in between the time the war ended before the communists mm. took over. He was just able to get out of the country on a forged passport, and he went to South America, but because of the work that he had done in the underground university, he had contracted, contacted uh, Alfred Tarski, the professor in logic here at uh, Berkeley, and so after some correspondence, uh, Tarski arranged for him to be invited into a junior position mm -hmm. here in Berkeley. And so he was completely amazed that I had read his article because he didn't expect that a sophomore would know anything about uh, what he had been doing there. So that started a very fine relationship and uh, 
he had some problems that he was working on and he got me interested in the problems and I came up with some answers there and we wrote some joint uh, papers together. As an undergraduate? As an undergraduate, yes, that was uh, uh, between sophomore and junior, mm. junior years and so that was very key. Of course, he was very close to Tarski and introduced me to Tarski and then that led, that led on. Alas, he was a very bad driver and he was taking Tarski, Mrs. Tarski and another graduate student off to a mass meeting in Southern California and he had a very bad automobile accident oh. and the car ran, ro rolled over on him and uh, uh, he was killed that way. So that was, that was a terrible upset. Terrible. But uh, the connection with Tarski and the, uh, the Tarski school was uh, uh, very, very, very uh, already established, and and so uh, I then joined that school, and so. How so how are to, problems being framed through your contact with Tarski? How what is he doing in the shaping of your perspective? Okay, well, it was uh, already two things. I mean, through the uh, other teacher. I didn't uh, name him, his name was Kalitsky, Jan Kalitsky. Uh, he had already studied Tarski's work, and so then I read Tarski's papers uh, there. But the key thing about Tarski was that he was an absolutely masterful lecturer, just an incredibly good lecturer. And so uh, I was friends with several of the students, and we always went to his classes and so uh, it was his example of his teaching that was uh, extremely, extremely influential. I want to tell you a story about Tarski. Mm -hmm. So in uh, just before the war was uh, declared, he came to Harvard uh, for an international uh, congress and then war was declared and he couldn't return to Warsaw. Mm -hmm. His wife and the two children uh, were able uh, to uh, stay in the countryside. They survived and he got them out just by luck at the end of the war. But then he was caught here in America. And so uh, he tried to find some jobs. It was very difficult. There were many refugees. And um, then very luckily because uh, uh, Griffith C. Evans, who was chair of the department, the, the department's building is named after uh, Evans uh, now. Uh, he had wanted to build up the department here in Berkeley and he was taking advantage of various refugees that, right. that, that uh, came there. And so Tarski was invited to come here where he spent the rest of his uh, academic uh, career. <clears throat> On the East Coast he had made good friends with uh, 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 a fellow named McKinsey was very interested in his work. They did some collaboration together, and McKinsey had uh, been his P did done his PhD at Berkeley, and uh, so when Tarski moved here, McKinsey also moved to the mm -hmm. West Coast, and uh, in the first year that Tarski was here, the summertime was coming in, and it was announced that there would be a departmental picnic and everyone had to bring something to the picnic uh, out in Tilden Park. And so McKinsey and another friend in Tarski were in the car driving up to the park, and Tarski said, oh my gosh, the napkins, the napkins, I've forgotten the napkins, stop the car. And so he rushed into a drugstore and up to the counter and said to the boy behind the counter, napkins, napkins, do you have napkins? And the boy said, Sanitary napkin, sir? Sanitary, of course sanitary. <laughs> How many boxes? Four boxes, please. Fortunately, at the picnic, it was noticed what they were, and they were hidden away before anyone else uh, saw them. But Tarski was always extremely emphatic in getting things right and making sure uh, that uh, he was understood, and uh, that's an example of his of his uh, personality. Was he, as a teacher of, of yours, um, 
determined to send you in any direction. I'm, I'm always interested in mentoring, the extent to which um, he's thinking about you, your career, expectations perhaps of working with him um, in the university. Oh yes, yes, and he had many, and he had many students. He was extremely good in finding problems to work on, okay. but he also had standards and kept students working for years. Some of them took seven, eight years to get a PhD oh. because he just wouldn't sign off on their on their work. So there were two sides to that. I mean, right. uh, lots of interests, knowing where to look for problems, but also then insisting that you do more and more and more uh, to it. You decided not to do graduate work at Berkeley. That was because of my own fault. Tarski, a colleague in England, were translating the papers in German and French from before the, before the war, and uh, the uh, page proofs came to Tarski to correct, and it turned out that uh, uh, Professor Woodger, who was a biologist, was very, very good at languages, but he wasn't so good at the mathematics, and so several things were misunderstood in doing the translation. So Tarski hired various people to read the page proofs. So I did a very good job for about two, three months, and then I got sick of the whole job, mm. and I neglected my work very badly. I wouldn't even answer the telephone sometimes when he phoned, and he got very angry at me for neglecting the work. So he fired me. This was my first uh, year as a graduate student, so oh. he fired me uh, from that and was, was, was very mad at me. And it was my own fault. I mean, he'd hired me, he was paying me to do the, the work, which, which I didn't do. Fortunately, that year, Norman Steenrod from Princeton, the famous topologist, uh, was uh, visiting Berkeley, and so I went to him and asked him if there was any chance to be a graduate student at Princeton, and he gave me a very, very good recommendation, and so that's how I got to, to Princeton. Of, so, of this kind of accident, life is shaped. <laughs> so there you are at Princeton. Um, you're, you're already set on a career as a mathematician? Oh, definitely, yeah. See, yes. I, I had uh, done the, the BA in mathematics right. here and was a first-year graduate student. What did you um, expect of your career at Princeton? Where did you think you were going in mathematics? Well, uh, Princeton had a very uh, well-known logician, Alonzo Church, uh, as uh, on the faculty there, and so it was just obvious I would become his PhD student. But in, in what category of mathematics? Logic in, logic, in logic, because that was Tarski's area. Okay. And we all knew Church's name. He was very, he was very well known as a, a editor and promoter of logic, and so uh, I, I just continued there. Actually, for the work on the thesis, there were questions that had come to me through Tarski that I wrote about, and um, I, I say about Alonzo Church, uh, he was uh, very good in correcting the spelling in my thesis, but he didn't really contribute to the subject matter. Why was that? Well, he didn't need to. I mean, I got some results. Oh, because you were, yeah, your training and, had yeah, been so good yeah. at this point. Well, it was lucky. I, I was lucky to find some answers to some problems, and so that could develop into a thesis. And uh, he didn't, of course, uh, with any of his students, insist that they do absolutely what he wanted them to do, but what they find that they could do. So, that. What was the problem that you were seeking an answer to at this point? That's a little hard to explain here in the, the yeah. sitting room, but uh, Tarski's early work had shown that uh, the uh, logic of real numbers and the logic that you need for Euclidean geometry can be done in a very constructive way so that all problems can be solved when formulated in a certain way. Okay, I understand. And so uh, I did some work on it to 
expand that in a certain sense to higher dimensions and to relate the possible uh, interpretations of geometry in higher dimensions uh, to ordinary Euclidean geometry. And so that was, that was uh, what's part next? of it. What's next? Are you expecting an academic career? Oh, point? of course, yes. By that time, yes. I mean, because all my examples were professors, so I just yes. assumed that I would uh, want to become a, a professor. I'm just assuming that your thesis was accepted with some um, acclaim. Um, I wouldn't say acclaim, but it was regarded as, as satisfactory. Satisfactory. <laughs> so, but I want to tell you more about uh, Princeton because yes. Princeton is such a center for mathematics. All kinds of people uh, came through there, and the Institute for Advanced Study is extremely important in uh, Princeton. Uh, I mean, that's where uh, von Neumann was and where he did his first computing machine uh, there that I had the opportunity uh, to work on. Mm. And of course, one of the key things for logic was Gödel. Does the name Kurt Gödel mean something to you? No. Have you heard about him? No. Okay, he was a brilliant student as an Austrian in his 20s and solved some outstanding problems. Uh, and then at the after through the war, he wasn't uh, Jewish, but uh, he had a number of problems in Vienna, and he emigrated to the to the States uh, just at the beginning of the war there. And von Neumann uh, arranged for him to be appointed to the Institute for Advanced Study, where he spent the rest of his career. But he was a, a, a very, uh, uh, I mean, he had this great fame for his work in logic, but also he was a rather a difficult personality, and I want to tell you a couple of uh, stories about him. Uh, throughout his life, he had some uh, questions, had some problems of being uh, too worried about things, maybe some, almost sometimes in his life, uh, paranoid about difficulties and things like that. Mm. Uh, but he was very brilliant, and he. Uh, uh, also mentored lots and lots of people who came on visiting times for the, at the Institute for Advanced Study. And so there was really a school of logic that was uh, there in Princeton combined with the university and, uh, and the institute. So uh, Professor Church's uh, secretary, who was uh, the wife of a graduate student, a uh, co-graduate student, a uh, uh, friend of mine, was on the city bus one day when Mrs. Girdle got on the bus. Mrs. Girdle is Viennese uh, also. And she was greeted by a friend, and she'd been to the hospital where her uh, husband had been uh, there with an illness. And the friend said, how is your husband doing? And Mrs. Girdle said, oh, that man, he's nothing but a brain on two legs. <laughs> Which sounds rather bad <laughs> coming from the wife, but I know what she meant. Gödel was so clever, you could never win an argument with him. No matter what you suggested, he would find if, ands, and buts to confuse and refute, refute uh, things. So that, that's... Uh, uh, that's, I'm sure, and he drove his doctors crazy because he objected to everything they wanted to do. He always had the wor worries about it. Another uh, statement of Mrs. Girdle that I particularly cherish was <clears throat> the time that the Reitermeisters came from Europe. They'd been friends in Europe, and they came to visit Princeton, and it was decided on Sunday we should have a drive in the country. But then uh, Gödel himself decided that no, he would stay home, and they could go, they could go uh, on the drive. So there they were in the car, and all of a sudden Mrs. Gödel said, "Oh, it's wonderful to be out for a drive and not to have a genius in the back seat." <laughs> so maybe that gives you a little bit of a feeling of his personality, but. I want, I want you in the mix, though. <laughs> I want to know, and, and this is rather baldly asked. How clever did you think you were in this amazing circle of logicians? 
Well, there were lots of other mathematicians, too, uh, like John Nash had just gotten his uh, PhD there, uh, and he was regarded as, as, a, as a super, super genius at the time, and there were many other extremely uh, uh, successful mathematicians there. So I just felt myself as kind of middle, middle level. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, thinking of myself as, as very exceptional, uh, like many of the people uh, there. But I was lucky that a mathematician from the University of uh, Chicago spent a sabbatical at the Institute for Advanced Study, Paul Halmos, and so I was getting my PhD in uh, 58, and so uh, he uh, said, well, come as an instructor. In those days, you had instructors before you became assistant professor. Right. Come to the University of Chicago. Uh, so that was a lucky thing to meet someone that way. And then, uh, uh, you know, I didn't have to search for a job, but... Yes, very and, lucky. Uh, that, that, you know. And where is Chicago in your intellectual development? Uh, so you go, you go to Chicago um, as an instructor. Well, the University of Chicago also was an amazing center for mathematics and many other things, uh, uh, too, of course. I mean, it's a major uh, university. Uh, and uh, it also, uh, in, in my life, had the advantage that I met and married my wife there, too, so it was a, it was a lucky move to be there. Right. Again, you don't know with these moves Indeed. what's going to happen to you in life. There. And uh, uh, so... Uh, uh, I developed more, more of my research uh, went forward there, and it, it set the tone for continuing. But Chicago was very, very competitive, and so I wasn't hired after to, to continue after two years. Oh. But I had an offer from Berkeley, from the Tarski School, to come back to Berkeley, and so in 1960 yes. we, we moved back to uh, back to California. When do I find the individual interested in computation in the logician, the mathematical logician? Where is that? How is that evolving as an interest? Okay, well, it came through uh, an area of logic called recursive function theory. So here at Berkeley, <clears throat> there were uh, two excellent people. The One was a professor, Raphael Robinson, and his wife, Julia Robinson, uh, uh, did her thesis under Tarski. But in those days, because of nepotism laws, you couldn't have both a husband and a wife as professor in the same, same department. And so Julia never had a position here until much later in life. Uh, she uh, uh, was elected finally to the National Academy, and she became president of the Ma American Mathematical Society. And so then Berkeley, uh, out of embarrassment almost, appointed her as a, as a professor. But she and her husband uh, worked together very, very much, and uh, her work was very, very much admired. And uh, so they were, they were quite uh, role models uh, for me, too, because of their interest in recursive function theory. And I want to tell you a story about uh, Julia, yes. that her uh, uh, sister... Uh, told us. Uh, so during the war, uh, there were a number of war projects on campus, and so Julia was hired on this project. And uh, the uh, requirement on the project was you had to write a report on what you did every week. So Julia's first week's report was as follows. Monday tried to prove a theorem. Tuesday tried to prove a theorem. Wednesday tried to prove a theorem. Thursday tried to prove a theorem. Friday theorem false. She was never asked to write a report after that. <laughs> they felt that she would just continue on with her work all right. Uh, but they were, they were great role models uh, for me, and so that interested me a lot in uh, recursive function theory. And then at Princeton, two of Church's 
uh, thesis students in the 1930s were quite, uh, quite uh, important in the development of recursive function theory, and particularly Stephen Claney, who was a longtime professor at uh, uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, and wrote very influential books there. And he came as a, uh, he came as a uh, visiting professor uh, to uh, Princeton while I was a graduate student there, and I got to know him very well. And of course, all of us had been studying his books uh, and, and his work too, and so that was a very, very strong influence. And then one of the professors in uh, electrical engineering at that uh, time was uh, working on computers, and he got, for me and another graduate student, the chance to work on the von Neumann computer at Princeton, and so I had some introduction to actually trying to make a computer do something. And so uh, that, that was uh, 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 a strongly uh, motivating experience, getting to see how computers actually could, uh, could do things. Of course, the problem I did was a very simple one, but still, for, for me, it took a lot of thinking to, to make it work. Then when I came to Berkeley after being in Chicago for two years, the computer uh, idea was just beginning to take on in uh, that 1960. Uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of computers. We depended on mainframes and other things like that. And so, and also that was just the point where the Algol language became popular. And there was a professor here in uh, numerical analysis who was very keen on that, and so he and I became friends, and he introduced me to that. And so uh, that was the next influence was to uh, to uh, have that, that uh, connection with people actually working with computers here at at uh, Berkeley. I was then uh, uh, through various combination of personal influences convinced it to change from Berkeley to Stanford in uh, 63. And so when I went to Stanford, there was also a big development there, though it, it took some time for the computer science departments to actually be uh, formed. They, were, they began as parts of electrical engineering, usually. But I got to meet interesting people there, like Don Knuth, yes. uh, whose name I'm sure uh, you know. And and who so, has actually been interviewed for this. I hope so. I hope so. Indeed. Yes, yes. Sir. Um, at what point are you beginning to feel you are making a contribution, um, advancing um, the idea of um, perhaps logic and the computer or complexity and the computer? Where are you beginning to get excited about what you might? add to the field? Okay, well, as I say, the uh, computer science department really hadn't been formed there yet in the uh, uh, mid-60s, uh, but there were a number of people working right. with ideas of computers and using computers, and there were several uh, good students there, uh, in fact, uh, uh, some of them. In one of my seminars, uh, I'm blocking on her name, uh, one of the recent uh, uh, Turing Award winners, who's now been a long-term uh, uh, professor at uh, MIT, she was in my uh, seminar that I had there in, uh, in Stanford, and uh, I think I influenced her a bit with, with uh, her, her uh, very successful career, just as when she was a beginner there then. So I had connections there and were doing some teaching, and so uh, that was part of the development. But the, really the crucial thing that happened was that um, in 68-69, uh, when I was on uh, sabbatical, first in Amsterdam I met some uh, people in the computer area there uh, that I later had a contact with, but in the uh, uh, summer of 1969, 
Uh, Patrick Supis, who was my mentor and friend at Stanford, had uh, uh, recommended me to go to an IFIP, International Federation of Information Processing, workshop during the summer, uh, and where I met a lot of people trying to talk about the connection uh, of uh, understanding computer programming and the logic that should go along with it, and many of them I really didn't think had uh, good enough ideas there, but there was one person mm -hmm. whom I really related to and understood what he was saying, that was Christopher Strachey, uh, who was in Oxford at that time, previously had been in Cambridge, and was very influential in early developments with uh, computer languages. Later, your names were linked. Yes, because I felt that Strachey had the best possible ideas, so I arranged to go for an extra term of leave that summer then, in the, in the fall of 69, to Oxford to work with Strachey, and so that was that was uh, the the key the key thing there. Uh, what insight? I know it's simplifying a very complex process, but what insight emerged uh, from your your work together? Uh, you must have published um, a key. Yes, I can, I can tell you. I, I don't know how well I can explain it to you, but. Uh, Strachey was trying to use a certain kind of uh, mathematical technique that had been developed by Church. Uh, it's a technique for uh, giving abstract definitions of functions. It's called technically lambda calculus because a Greek letter lambda is used in it, but of course that doesn't mean anything, it's just a Greek letter. But uh, Church developed it in a very formalistic way without any mathematical models. And so I told Strachey, you can't just use this formalism, you have to have something that has a real mathematical interpretation to relate this kind of logic of definition to the computations that you have to do. And so from experience that I'd had with uh, colleagues at Stanford, I wanted to, and also going back to work of Claney earlier that I knew about, I wanted to explain to him that he could adapt some of the things that had been done in logic and recursive function theory on a more theoretical frame. He could adapt those to his problem that he wanted to, to do to relate to uh, com uh, computer languages. And so I wrote out a uh, report on that about how I thought it should be done. Yes. And in doing that, I had to develop certain mathematical structures to explain uh, what, uh, what was going on with it. And then one Saturday in November, I was lying on the, in our rented flat, I was lying on the bed in the guest room, and I thought to myself, oh no, if these mathematical structures can be expanded in this way, there must be an expansion that provides a mathematical model for Church's system. For years I've said the Church's system made no sense because it didn't have any mathematical mm -hmm. models. But once you tried to expand certain kinds of structures to do things similar to what Church's formal system did, then Church's system did have mathematical wow. models. And so that was the key for the, the thing, and that was uh, then developed by a number of students in Oxford and, and colleagues of uh, Christopher Strachey, and of course my, my later students as well. What was that called as an insight? I mean, is there a, a theory that that... <laughs> Yes, and it won't. And the name uh, name won't uh, make any uh, make any sense. Uh, I called it domain theory because the structures were good domains on which to do your to do your definitions. And that has stuck. <laughs> and that has stuck. Uh, but the but the, uh, the the idea is really to um, 
you, you see, uh, recursive function theory focused in its development, going back to Glaney very much too, on functions from integers to integers, but now an integer is a very discrete thing, and you get a very discrete value there, and th there's lots uh, to say about what kind of computations uh, are, are possible. But you should also think of operators that operate not just on the integers, but operate on functions, or operate on operators, or operate on operators that operate on yeah, operators, right. Right, and so on. And so the question was how to build up a structure that explains the coherence of this hierarchy of operators. And so, so that's, that's what I uh, that's what you work on. made a discovery that there was a, a, a good one to, to, to look at that would uh, give the, interpret, the missing interpretation for Church's Lambda Calculus. Was Oxford a it sounds like a very salient, important point in your intellectual development because of this relationship, I suppose, with Strachey. This, oh, absolutely. This yes. Yes. And then, uh, uh, so, I mean, we had that good collaboration over one, one uh, term there in the fall of 69. Uh, and then I, I took up my job in uh, uh, Princeton. I changed mm -hmm. from Stanford uh, to Princeton. And uh, Strachey came to visit me in Princeton, and uh, we did some collaboration, but it was difficult at long distance to do too much collaboration. And then completely out of the blue, I had an offer to become the first professor of mathematical logic in Oxford. In Oxford, back to Oxford. And so that was, that was uh, quite a difficult uh, decision. But I especially hope to be able to uh, start a new strong collaboration with Strachey. What happened, I mean, it, it, there, there, there was a uh, good, good start there, but it turned out that over the years, perhaps Strachey had had too many sherries uh, before <laughs> supper that his liver gave out. Oh, oh, that's so funny. And he died very quickly after the oh, really? liver, liver uh, shut down. Just a few years that after you yes, had come to Oxford? Yes, yes. And in the intervening time when I went to Oxford and his very unfortunate death, you see Oxford is completely uh, governed by the faculty, not by the administrators. Right. They don't really have the same kind of administrative uh, things we have. So it's committees, 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 committees. And I was on two faculties, philosophy and mathematics. Oh. And Strachey was starting up the program in computer science. There wasn't a degree in computer science right away. It started uh, under him. And so there were lots more committees to do it. And then, of course, the whole is an exam-based system, yes. and so you have to write exams, you have to write all the syllabus for the exams, and then you have to correct the exams. So it's committees, no committees, research. so there was no time for collaboration before he died, so that wow. was sad. But the big advantage of Oxford was I had a whole number of really excellent students there, and so it was, a, it was a very good atmosphere. Of course, what ruined it in the end was Mrs. Thatcher, because when she came in in the end of the 70s, the whole financial picture changed. Uh, you know, for example, the Thatcher government insisted that overseas students had to pay full fees. Okay? So around the country, many uh, programs shut down because they weren't getting half of their students from right. overseas right. and things like that. So then when out of the blue I had an offer from Carnegie Mellon in uh, 1980, the financial situation, I hadn't ever intended of leaving Oxford, but the financial situation was very discouraging. A very wonderful young uh, colleague, after he got his uh, degree, he interviewed 12 times at least and always came in second and 
had to go and be a school teacher for a period. Mm -hmm. Eventually got a university position, but it was very bad times for academic uh, positions, so that was very discouraging. The, the university you went to, Carnegie Mellon, uh, what was its situation and commitment to computation as a field um, by, by now, it's established? Well, yeah, so they, they just had their 50th anniversary uh, two years ago, uh, I think. And so they were well established by 1980. Uh, so Stanford started about at the same uh, time with their uh, computer science uh, department. And uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon also had made a very big uh, name in artificial intelligence through yes. various uh, people there. Some of them are, uh, are Turing Award winners, as you, as you know. Uh, so. Um, it was a very well-established uh, uh, program. Oxford was still at the beginning of its uh, computer science program, and so uh, Carnegie Mellon had much more to offer in the way of computer science, so that was part of the attraction. Was there a distinction made between theoretical uh, computation inquiry and applied and practical? Oh, of course, all the time, yes, right. And sometimes they don't talk to each other, right? Ah, <laughs> okay. But you were invited as a theorist. Yes, yes. And the department was willing and happy to have a theorist there. Was theory developed particularly? Well, there are lots of aspects uh, to theory. Uh, a lot of it has to do with combinatorics. A lot of it is much more like Don Knuth. Uh, for example, I think Don Knuth partly would be called a theorist. I mean, he's done fantastic actual computations, uh, amazing ones uh, in his life. Uh, but also, uh, there, there's, uh, there are other uh, aspects to that that is really regarded as theoretical. And so uh, Carnegie Mellon was very glad to try to develop that kind of uh, program. And so uh, that... Uh, you continue to have a very active and productive intellectual life, and we can't get to all of it, but is there a next stage we might spend some time with where uh, the questions you're asking and perhaps the solutions you're finding are something that are key in your career? Uh, well, again, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, I mean, that's starting in the 80s, and then I uh, retired in uh, 2003. Right. Uh, they were, it was very attractive for students, so there were a lot of good students that uh, came through there. And so that was, uh, that was uh, also very uh, lucky for me. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, two of my, uh, in the later years, two of my best students came from Slovenia. Mm -hmm. The difference between the Western countries and the Eastern European countries is that at the... Uh, college level, the Eastern European countries had much more traditional programs, and so uh, because computer science is sometimes a very mixed uh, uh, environment, there uh, the Eastern Europeans had better maths from their basic college uh, education, better mathematics than some of the American students. Yes. Uh, did. And so, as I say, two of my students that I'm still in close contact with in, uh, in uh, Slovenia uh, were uh, extremely good to, to have there, but uh, there are also uh, several other ones too, and so I've been really lucky in, in having uh, students. Another uh, group came from uh, Scandinavia, especially from Denmark, mm. uh, and so one of my last students is... Uh, head of a department in, in Denmark now and uh, doing extremely well. Let's end in the present, uh, both in terms of your interests, but also as you speak to the next generations of, uh, of researchers, what are the interesting problem and directions and perspectives that you would convey? <laughs> uh, yes, that's, I, I don't quite know how what to uh, put into uh, words here. Um, um, 
I mean, they're, they're just lots and lots of problems available, but one thing that I see in the present time is knowing what has been done in the past and what you should build on. And so uh, my experience in the last, uh, last five years here is that the uh, internet has absolutely completely changed research. For one thing, there are things like Archive that is at uh, Cornell University, which is a repository. Uh, and so it was really started by physicists because I think physicists are always uh, under a lot of pressure, it's kind of one-upmanship, who has the next big idea. And so journal publication was too slow, so they put things in electronic form in, in archives so they're available Media. tomorrow. Yes, right. right. That's been fantastic to have the preprint things available there. But the other thing that I use absolutely every day is Google Scholar, because if you, if you say Google Scholar, then a new search page comes up there. And then if you put in the right names and the right keywords, you find decades of references to books and journal articles on the subject there. And so I think a uh, problem that we have to solve is with this incredible richness of available materials. How do you get an idea as to what's important for your work, what's been done in the past, mm -hmm. what to do, how to keep your bibliography uh, you know, uh, sufficiently detailed enough and all of that. Uh, I think we need more tools that will come with the internet to help with research there. Other kind of thing that is completely changing is the cloud. What does the cloud mean? It means you can have just your iPhone, say, and communicate with the cloud and find all kinds of materials, data, pictures, articles, that sort of thing. In other words, you don't have to have your own big computer you just have to have a connection in the cloud to find things that you, that you need so to work with. So this is a phenomenal opportunity, but also perhaps a confusion? Yes, lots of confusion as to how really to organize your thoughts to make the best use of all right. of those now, facilities. As a, as a young man, uh, you are facing a world of limited information. Um, as I sense that I mean, in the beginning of a field, a way to think, uh, fundamental insights to be to be found, and this feels like an era where there is so much out there to be sorted. Is that a oh yes, a that's I, that's been the big change because I mean, uh, in the fifties or the sixties when you were in college, there yeah. there were only certain journals where you would look to find the things. But now there's just an incredible worldwide connected wealth of wealth of information, and it uh, really takes a lot of effort to keep track of what's uh, going Mike, on. Just as a final question, what line of work would you enter into as as a young computational logician <laughs> now? Okay, I I think yes, I think I can answer that because I have a. A uh, uh, very brilliant colleague in Berlin that I've been uh, working with, and that's using the computer to prove theorems. And there have been several great successes with that, but it needs lots more development because it's hard to communicate with computers to get them to do things. And the question is how to be able to say questions which are you can understand which you can then give to a mechanical device to do something to, and then to get answers out of it that you can also understand there. So there's been a lot of excellent development, and I know many people around the world uh, working on those things, but uh, in a way, it hasn't had an impact on uh, mathematics 
the same as, say, for example, John Nash was able to do with pencil and paper when he proved his theorems there. Right. But, but there's a big opportunity to get the computers to do scientific deduction, and I think that's going to be the next big breakthrough. It's, 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 not, it's not solving questions in jeopardy or uh, doing, or doing uh, you know, games, uh, chess, winning chess games, but proving theorems will be a big, a big development, and I would recommend someone to go into that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor Scott. Thank you for being here.